trading on episode 68. Guess what? You're a trader. And, you know, like what I tell people, would John Elway give you a chance to be the starting quarterback of the Broncos Sunday? And most people will say, absolutely not. You know, I'm not in a physical condition. Uh, I don't know the playbook. I'm just Joe Schmo couch potato. So obviously, no, that's who you're competing against. You're, you're going, you're the starting quarterback. Once you put capital in a trading account, and you start pushing the buttons, you're competing against Peyton Manning. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax. Learn the process. Yeah, it looks like pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up, traders? Welcome to another installment of the Trading Up Podcast. I'm your host, Cam Hawkins, and today we've got Clayton Allen on the show. Now, Clayton was recommended by one of my listeners out there as the plumber who turned into a trader. So we've got a fantastic show, slightly different from, well, different kind of trader from what my typical sort of manual discretionary trader. Uh, He's a bit of a mix of everything, and you're going to hear that in a second. In fact, what he trades is a system which we've heard of before, not in the Trading Nut podcast, but in my 52 Traders podcast. So you're going to hear about that, and you're also going to hear about how this sort of system is very similar to one of the robots that I'm trading uh, at the moment as part of the Robot Traders Club. And so if you guys are in that club and you're trading something we call Feed the Beast, then, uh, then listen to this episode because it is going to give you some massive insight into different ways of trading this and, and how we can perhaps uh, manage some of the, the more trickier situations that we might get into with this particular robot. Also, it does. we do go into a, a, a discretionary way of trading uh, on higher time frames, which can also be used with the sort of robotic strategies. And in fact, Clayton does give us a demo on a YouTube walkthrough video that's up going to be up there on the site so go and check it out after the show tradingnut.com and you'll be able to find Clayton's episode there with the video we shot afterwards which is fantastic because it is basically a little strategy in its own right so even if you're not uh, into trading robots uh, and you're just a a manual trader you're going to learn something there uh, which is fascinating um, albeit very much around the mindset side of things so um, guys before we get into the show I do want to talk to you about the big news of the moment, and look, I'm just completely and utterly uh, fixated by it, which is the coronavirus uh, stuff that's out there at the moment. Now, one thing I suppose it's highlighted a few different things. One of the one of the well, yeah, one of the main things that's highlighted for me is the fact that being a trader and not just an investor who you know buys and holds or just buys and uh, and in one direction, being a trader that can go long and go short, can understand the market. You're in the best situation possible. Even a business owner is not, you know, you're susceptible to what is going on now around coronavirus. So that's why trading is, I suppose, the penultimate uh, skill to master and the reason to, you know, that so many people want to try and tackle this business of trading because it is essentially, you know, you're recession proofing yourself. So while everyone else is out there, struggling to you know keep hold of their job or keep hold of their business as a trader you're not and we i don't know if we talked about it in the show with clayton but we definitely spoke about it afterwards if not in the show whereby people are saying oh look you know the market's tanking you must be struggling you're you're trading full time and he's like no i I made x number of percent last week uh while everyone else is struggling because i trade forex um or i short the market whatever it is so guys this is something to uh, to to think about whilst you're on this journey, and you know, even as hard as it may feel or be it sometimes, this is this is part of the reason why while we're all here listening to this podcast, doing these interviews, uh, being in the market, spending all this time at the charts uh, on an ongoing basis. Now, 
Just before we get into the show, I do want to say, look, I, I hope you guys are all out there being safe around the coronavirus and you all get through this and we all get through this out the other side, whenever that is. Like it could be, what I've heard is it could be a year away before things start to return to normal. So use that time. If you're stuck at home in quarantine or whatever it is, use that time to do something productive on the charts. Listen to a few of these old episodes in the show and we talk about quite a few of them. Uh, as we're coming up, because Clayton used to be a 52 Traders listener, and uh, I'm sure there's some shows that you guys will want to go and check out after listening to this. So, right, let's get into it, guys. Here we go. Clayton Allen. All right, folks, we've got Clayton Allen here on the show. Now, recommended by one of my listeners uh, as a plumber turned trader. So I thought, I've got to get this guy on. He's got his own podcast as well. So, Clayton, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Cam. I'm so uh, I'm kind of starstruck being on this show. I've been listening to it since the 52 Trader days. Yes. So thanks for having me. Yeah, look, it's it's odd. It's not often that I get people that come on with, uh, uh, I suppose, experience of listening to me on 52 Traders. So, so how did you how did you chime into that show? So, uh, in my early days in trading, probably 2009 ish, 2010. I uh, was following a guy named Rob Booker and, and you had him on one of your episodes. I can't remember which number. And, you know, he had his own podcast called the, you know, the Booker report or um, trade for a living. So he, he broadcasted that he was going to be on your show. So I shot on over and, and listened to it and, you know, just subscribed that day and have listened to every show since. You know, and then there was that little pause where you you switched from fifty two traders to trading nut, so I had to make the jump over, but I made that jump. Nice, so, nice. Now that's how I found you. Wow. So it's it's uh so it sounds like I mean okay well let, actually let's get your full story. Let's get the the story from you know your yeah. beginnings to to your interest in trading, and then where you ended up. Oh, how you ended up where you are now. Okay, so it's kind of a long story. So. so I uh, I went to college here in Denver, or uh, is actually in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, I went there on a wrestling scholarship, and you know I grew up on a farm, uh, northern Colorado. So right about my sophomore year of college, my parents had split up. So I dropped out of school, went back home to help my mom sell the farm, and started plumbing. Right, I was like, I got to get a job. I got to, you know, make some money. So, you know, I applied and got a a plumbing job. Well, turns out I was extremely good at it and, you know, skyrocketed to the top and, you know, found myself, you know, some years later running 50 to $60 million mechanical projects, pretty much every high rise that was built here in Denver in the, you know, the nineties and early two thousands. Well, with that came, you know, higher and higher wages. And I had purchased a bar or bought into part ownership of a bar here in Denver. And when that became a little profitable, I got bought out. So I had, I had quite a bit of cash right when 2008 happened, right when the economic meltdown, right? So I was watching I was watching the news, right? I think it was, that was right when Obama got voted in and, you know, and all the automakers were coming in to talk to him about a bailout and Ford left without a bailout. So I probably did the stupidest thing anyone could do is I took $110,000 cash that I had and I bought Ford stock after I found out they didn't need a bailout. I mean, obviously, I looked at their 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 chart, and they were trading probably thirty two dollars an hour or thirty two dollars a share um, before the meltdown, and the current price was like a dollar ninety two. So I went all in, stupid, and two years later, it was back to thirty thirty one dollars a share. So I made, uh, you know. One trade, big home run, and, you know, I'm still full-time plumber working, and then I handed my money over to money managers, which we're all told to do, and, you know, I just was not happy with their performance, 
So that's how I found 4X was, you know, I'd work all day, um, come home at night and the Forex markets were open. And, you know, obviously now I know here in Denver, that's the, you know, the Sydney and the, the Asian, which are typically the worst, worst uh, sessions to discretionary trade in, but that's what I was doing in the beginning. So after a while, like most traders, you know, I, I was just demo trading at first and I'd never blown up a demo demo account or a live account even to, to this day. So I think out of the gate, I had that, that, uh, you know, intuition not to push the limit and blow up my account. That seems like most traders when they first start out do over and over and over again. So over time, I, you know, I developed some strategies, you know, through, um, like I said, I was following Rob Booker at that time and he had, he had a lot of great strategies and most of them were free, right. On YouTube. And, you know, I started to play with some of the the concepts he was teaching and I kind of landed on some, you know, a few, one or two strategies that was really working for me. The only problem I had then was I didn't have time to watch the 28 currency pairs I, I was trading at the time and wait for those setups. So like most traders, I found, you know, I was putting positions on a little too early or a little too late. So that's when EAs were really big. Uh, I mean, everyone and their dog was trying to sell them. And, you know, I, uh, I basically landed on, you know, that's when I decided to join Rob Booker's lifetime membership, which he gave you access at that, that time to all of his robots. So, and he would give you the source code. So once I did that, I took, took his, his robot, the Finch and the source code, and then just went on this medieval, uh, you know, path to where I'm at today you know, developing my own filters and, uh, you know, it's, it's a far stretch from Rob Booker's Finch today, but it's kind of based on the same concept It you know, it uses Knoxville divergence as a trigger. And I, you know, roll, use the, his rollover theory where most traders, you know, would say would crucify me where I add to losing, losing positions, but you know, I've gotten extremely consistent using it and, you know, no, as you know, Cam, no EA is perfect. It will get in trouble. And that's where, you know, you have to know how to trade your way out of trouble. And, you know, you always got to have your fingers on the pulse of the market and you always have to be able to know how to discretionarily trade your way out of trouble. So that's pretty much how, You know, I got to, you know, fast forward to today. I mean, in in August 2018, I quit my job and, you know, at that, you know, oh, wait, let's back up. So in 2013, I built a uh, high rise luxury brand hotel here in Denver. I won't say names, but it's super high end and it was a a great project and uh, I got to know the owners really well. And after I left that project, they had a lot of problems with maintenance in it and they were being told that it was just built wrong. So obviously that problem rolled over onto me because I built all the plumbing and mechanical in the, in the building. So I helped them navigate through that. And at, you know, long story short, they offered me a job and I quit the mechanical plumbing world and became uh, director of engineering for the Americas for this luxury brand hotel and instantly skyrocketed into wearing a suit and tie, flying around the world, putting out fires and other, you know, other countries. And right about that same time is when I had my, my twins. So, by trading at that time, I was 
super consistent, already, you know, growing my account, um, letting the robot do its thing and just checking in on it every day and trading my way out of trouble. And during that period of time, you know, I took a, a $40,000 account um, to when I quit that job in 2018 to almost 2.3 million now. So, you know, and, and when I quit my job is when, <laughs> is when everyone was like, what are you doing? How can you leave a job like that? That was like the job of a lifetime. You made great money. You got to stay at hotels for free around the world. Benefits paid. And, you know, for me, having that time with my kids, being able to stay here and not travel was worth it. And I was making more trading. So in 28, uh, in August 2018 is when I, you know, decided to go all in, be a full-time trader. And I started Allen FX uh, because I was flooded with people just wanting me to trade their accounts. You know, when you have that good of a performance and, and people around you see the changes, you know, they they want you to trade their money. And I didn't want, you know, any part of, you know, taking their money and trading it for them. Because I, you know, I don't want access to people's money. You know, I don't want to end up on, you know, some form of American greed, you know. So I uh, found some software that allows people to copy my trades uh, directly on, I just link my MT4 account to their MT4 account and whatever goes on mine goes on theirs. And obviously if it's different balance, it, it's mathematically broke down to be the same risk trade. So I launched that right as I quit. Uh, pro, you got 84 people within like three months of my friends and family. And, you know, I've been trading my account and, uh, sending signals to theirs ever since till today, right. Till last week. And, you know, now I'm reaching out and trying to, trying to grow it with other, other people out there that are either struggling in Forex or, you know, have never heard about it right? There's a lot of people have never even heard Forex. And when I tell them I'm a trader, they instantly think equities. And, you know, we have a week like last week with the US equities market. And I get a lot of calls like, well, are you bankrupt yet? And yeah, exactly. How was your week? And I'm like, completely different, dude. I trade <laughs> currency. <laughs> I actually made 4.3% last week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know I've heard, I heard the same thing. I hear the same thing all the time, actually. Right. Uh, yeah. It's a small, small community. And, you know, that's really why I, I do my podcast, right? It's called The Day Trading Plumber um, because I like telling stories and, and trying to take a very complicated subject like Forex trading and break it down, uh, you know, no offense to plumbers, but so they can understand it, right? Because a lot of people in the craft trades like I was in, they don't trust guys in suits, the big money guys. And, you know, all these guys have five to 25 grand in their savings accounts. And, you know, the, the, the big uh, money management companies, they're not looking for to help these guys, you know, and they're not, I mean, what's a $20,000 account to Fidelity? Right. And so, you know, I thought there'd be a, a, I think there's a good niche of people who, you know, if they're exposed to Forex trading the right way, you know, you can make decent returns and manage your risk if you're not a banana head. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, you're right. Cause I mean, I just remember it reminds me of a story that my, um, brother told me so you're sitting in his office and uh he he used to trade uh on metatrader 4 and all that sort of stuff and with robots and what have you and uh look this was years ago and he he had a couple of guys in coming to fix the air conditioning or, or whatever it was and um he saw them chatting to each other and he looked over and one of the guys had the mt4 app out and was showing them you know how this thing was this robot was taking over on his on his phone and um so yeah these are the, there are guys out there that are you know who wouldn't be your typical traders who who you know who 
can utilize this sort of stuff to to get ahead and and, um, do things a little bit differently. Um, I want to touch back on what you mentioned earlier around the Finch, because we we actually had a guy on, and you probably remember him because he was at the episode after Rob Booker, and you would know him, uh, Scott Hayward on on the 52 Traders podcast. Right. He was on, yep. yeah, trading the Finch, and uh, at that time, I think he was making about a thousand dollars a day. Um, things were going well. Uh, I looked back not that long ago, and I saw that his like live whatever it was empty. Uh, sorry, my FX book account was pretty much at, at break, well, at zero. So he said drawn down as whatever he'd put in it, maybe three hundred grand, and, and now was sort of. Uh, I don't know. Basically, he'd, he'd, he'd taken yeah. all the money out. It's, it was somebody put it quite nicely. It was a, it was a nice way to sort of withdraw your your life savings um, over the course of however long it was, two or three years. That you know, he put in three hundred and, and he'd sort of taken out that the thousand and and used it to to live. Which you know, it's it's not the end of the world. But um, how did you manage to? to what were the, some of the things that I suppose without giving away your trade secrets mm. or, that that took you from? Um, using the Finch to to making it work for you on a consistent basis because I know a lot of people even just the other day somebody said um, you know the Finch and if for those that are listening that don't really know what this is it's a it's a robot that doesn't trade with a stop loss and it trades right. very frequently um, and hedges a position I think sometimes that was the original strategy anyway yeah and and my my strategies today still follow those same fundamentals, right? <clears throat> I don't trade with a stop loss, at least not on my first position. So let's just call that L1, where, you know, the Finch, Rob Booker's Finch, would take its first position. And, you know, you could select which time frame that would be, one minute, five minute. I highly suggest not putting it on a one minute unless you want 70 trades an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um uh so when it takes its first position you know rob's original settings were if that didn't work in your favor and it moved a certain distance of pips which you can set away from you now you're in a negative position on your l1 it will take a second trade and his original settings were to take a position size three times the size of that first trade and, you know, in hopes that it moves a little bit more the direction you need it and you close out both with at break even or a little small profit. Now, the robot was programmed to close both trades when you reached that setting, either break even or, you know, a certain profit target. But that was how simple the Finch was. And it had the same settings on each pair. Um, and, you know, you you as the human running it had to decide, uh, you know, okay, L2, it's, it's done programming route now. And now I'm in drawdown on both of those, those trades. You had to decide, do I, do I ride this out or is it time to just close it and move on? And like you said, Scott Haywood, his, his uh, version of it was quite different it was the exact same other than, you know, he was overseas. So he can, he can add a hedge function and, you know, I've never traded with hedge uh, abilities because here in the U S it's illegal or not recognized as, as a way to trade and we have to trade FIFO. So first in first out, which becomes, you know, very, very important on position sizing with the Finch. Because if you take a second position in the same, same, same uh, lot size, you're gonna you have to close the first one first. So how mine's different is mine will take up to five rollover trades, where the Finch would only take one, and I don't triple my position size. I slightly get bigger or smaller based on 10 years worth of uh, back testing I've done on each pair. And then I have, I've added in lots of different ways to change the RSI settings because the Finch works, you know, it's trigger to open the trade is Knoxville divergence, which I, I believe Rob explained in your show. It's, 
it's basically divergence. So you have a momentum indicator. So price, let's say price is going up and momentum is going down. Um, so now you have divergence. So his trigger is he added a, a third element, which is RSI. So it's, I still use Knoxville divergence today, not even in my discretionary trading uh, strategies, because it's a really good indication that that trend is either over or it's going to do a nice pullback, which is exactly what the Finch robot robots looking for. And I'm, I've also programmed in where each of my rollover trades can be taking, taken on a different time frame where the original Finch was, if you had it on a one minute, you're stuck on a one minute. So I've added in where I could trade my first, the first initial trade on a five minute or 15 minute chart. And then if that trade didn't work, I can, you know, through the series of L1 through L5, I can pick which time frame. And obviously the the larger the time frame, the less trades you're going to take, but it, the higher probability that, that, that divergence is going, going to work. Is that, does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And so, so I suppose what I'm quite interested to hear is, is you sort of, how did you, I mean that, yeah, it's, if we just look at that as a, as a, in a silo, you obviously have some better knowledge that helps you from a discretionary point of view, get yourself out of tricky situations and, and work out which one you're going to use M5 or M15 or some higher time frame. Yeah. How did you get to that? How did you get that sort of grow that, that skill set? Well, just, tr- you know, trading, you know, and uh, just being stubborn, I guess is the best word because Rob's Finch works extremely well. It just has one big problem. If you let it run and you don't you don't manage it, it will eventually, you know, margin call you because of drawdown. And so I knew I had I knew I had the you know, half of every trader's problem is what do I need to to enter the trade? What are all the rules? So I had that taken care of. I have a really good system that is highly probable and it's going to enter trades that are highly probable. However, it's going to stack up a lot of inventory that I'm going to have to deal with. And, you know, another guy, I believe you had him on named Sean Campbell. He was a guy I met through Rob Booker. He actually lives here in Colorado I'm not sure if he trades anymore or not, but he wrote this ebook that you could probably still find for free online called trading uh, inventory trading. And it really hit home to me um, that concept, right? The hardest thing to do in trading is as soon as you open a trade, it goes your direction and you're released of all that stress. And, you know, when it doesn't go the, the direction you want it, the stress starts building up and he starts saying I was wrong and I need to get out of this trade before it blows me up. So once I allowed myself to be, to, to be wrong on some trades or the robot to be wrong and then just manage it like a P and L like a normal business has uh, inventory or operating costs, right? Running my trading business I mean, a good analogy I use a, a lot is if I was, a, if my business was selling mattresses and in order to do that, I'm going to have to buy a bunch of mattresses, lease a space, hire a sales team or do the sales myself, uh, you know, run marketing ads. All of that cost is a drawdown. So to run a good business, you need to be, you need to manage all of those upfront costs. And then you start selling mattresses and you got revenue coming in and hopefully you, you are uh, making profit. Well, I look at how my robot trades and it, it's accumulating, it's accumulating that inventory. And just because the mattresses aren't selling the, the day after I buy them doesn't mean it's a bad system. 
it just me as as the CEO of running this, I need to I need to manage that. So I let my robot just go. And when drawdown starts to get close to 15%, I start playing defense. I may pause it from taking any new trades. And when I when I say pause it, I programmed in there where it will it will stop taking new trades, but manage all the open trades, meaning if they come back to their profit target, it will close. So it, it kind of allows me to live a, a busy life and just check in on it on my MT4 app, you know, every hour. And, you know, I really don't get involved until drawdown hits, you know, 15%, which to most traders freaks them out. And, you know, that's when you go down that, that spiraling hill of, oh my God, what am I going to do if I lose this 15%? And, and, you know, you panic, but I'm very comfortable. I've gotten very comfortable having, you know, as high as 15, 20% drawdown and then just shifting gears into defense mode and trade my way out. And, you know, obviously my back's not against the wall with any, any margin and I'm, I'm kind of protected kind of, you know, there's big, there's big quotes over that. I'm kind of protected against some big moves against me or in my direction. I mean, last week, it, you know, I, I was probably carrying a 5% drawdown and I ended the week probably at 15, but I didn't have to panic or get, get worried. Uh, I just didn't take any new trades. And, and, you know, while I'm carrying that drawdown, the robot is still taking, you know, if, if I don't have it paused, it's still raking in. You know, on average, my average take uh, or gain is, you know, right around one and a half percent a week for the last seven years. I haven't had a losing week since August. And, you know, we'll get to that later, but it was a, it was a big, it was a big loss. And it was mostly due because I turned my robot off and thought I was smarter than the robot and started discretionarily trading only with, you know, like we all do sometimes, you know, I thought, Hey, I, I could probably trade the same strategies, but now that I'm a full-time trader, I got more time. So, and now I have 84 people copying my trades. I want to produce for them. So I started pushing the, I started pushing the limit and we were making, I, I think average 6% a week. And, you know, my, my clients were like, holy cow, this is awesome. I've doubled my account in six months. You're a genius. And then I got caught uh, long, long Australian dollar versus the, the, uh, the Euro when uh, the trade war started over here with, with Trump and China. So, and then I held on to that thing, just like Scott Haywood, right? If you were watching, he was holding on to a bad trade for a long time. That was just, you know, becoming a thorn in his side. Same thing happened to me. Um, only this time I had 84 clients going on the ride with me. And I talk about it in my first episode of the podcast. And I wasn't sleeping. I couldn't do anything but watch this this pair. Uh, it, it was just, it was taking me down. And, you know, I just ended up closing it. And I lost a few clients that day, but most of them stuck with me and, you know, we've made back the loss. But for me, because, you know, I'm trading some pretty large accounts, it was a a personal loss of $800,000 to me that one day. So, you know, over a lifetime, it was still profit, right? That was all profit I've made over a lifetime, but it was a huge wake up call to me. And, you know, every trader goes through it. You know, you start having success, you start thinking you're invincible and your position sizes are growing and, you know, you, you basically feel bulletproof and, you know, the markets, the markets uh, remind you. And, uh, you know, luckily, you know, I, I didn't destroy my, all, all my ability to make a living and, um, you know, today, I think, uh, two weeks ago, I was able to get back what I had lost that day by adding a little bit more money to my account and just, just being smart and letting the robot, I mean, that's what got me here. Right. Yeah. And I don't know why I deviated from it, 
but you know, it was a, a lesson I had to learn, I guess. Yeah, it's, oh, it's an interesting story. And look, thank you very much for being so transparent about it because it's, uh, it's, I suppose, refreshing to hear uh, from somebody who's sort of gone through you know, this roller coaster ride and, and uh, is quite open about the losses as well. Um, yeah. You know, and, yeah. Sorry, go on. I, I think it's important. Um, it, it's important if you're in a, in a role like, like I am or, or you are, Cam, if you're talking to traders, you know, for some reason, everyone wants to hide their losses and, you know, it's creating this perception that, and, you know, if you go on Instagram and you see all these flexors putting their Ferraris and like, must be a trader, you know, and all these, all these stupid, you know, making it seem like it is the easiest thing in the world to make money. I mean, and don't get me wrong, physically, it's, it's pretty easy. If you got capital and you put it in a broker account and you watch a couple of YouTube videos on the, the, the mechanics of pushing the buttons on a MT4 account or a platform, guess what? You're a trader. And you know, like what I tell people, um, look, would John Elway give you a chance to be the starting quarterback of the Broncos Sunday? And most people will say, absolutely not. You know, I'm not in a physical condition. Uh, I don't know the playbook. I don't know, you know, I'm just Joe Schmo couch potato. So obviously no, but then, so why would you put your money? I mean, you, that's who you're competing against. You're, you're going, you're the starting quarterback. Once you put capital in a trading account and you start pushing the buttons, you're the starting quarterback and you're competing against Peyton Manning's out there. So, I mean, yes, it's very easy to do. And there's a lot of people that will tell you it's easy and just jump right in or buy my book and do all these things and hide the fact that they have taken losses. I mean, I share my, my FX book links with all my clients, everyone in my telegram group. I post my, my results each week and, you know, wins or losses and, you know, we move on and, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm tired of the people out there who are boasting about how they never lose because every real trader I know, which I know quite a few, you know, they lose, they take losses and it's just part of the game. Um, hopefully they're not big career ending losses, uh, but it happens. Yeah, it's it, it, it's also quite interesting. I mean, you're probably not you we're not the first and then you probably won't be the last, but recently there's been quite a few traders on that have traded without stop losses and use risk management to, you know, to to make money eventually, but you know, they do have to suffer some drawdowns at points. Uh I mean, and, and, and ironically enough, don't have that many losses as a whole, like hardly any. Uh What's what's your sort of view on the sort of no stop loss thing? And you know, if there was a massive black swan event or, or something like that, how do you sort of see that playing out? So, um, obviously, these black swan events they could be detrimental with no stops. And you know, I've lived through a few of them. You know, the the twenty sixteen when the Swiss bank <laughs> quit pegging the Swiss. Luckily, I wasn't in any trade that, I mean, that uh, then when that happened. Um, but for instance, like one that comes to, to, to mind was December 2nd, 2019, when uh, I was in, I was long the US dollar JPY. And if you look at the chart, if you go to like a daily chart and look at that day, you will see a massive, massive spike. I, I, I believe it shut down most brokers platform for about 10 minutes um the australian dollar shot up i mean there was there was a huge move um was that was that I, on uh, january the second was it or december you said december i remember january had like a thousand pip move yeah i think it was that january was it? Yeah, I, yeah. you know because i was still on christmas break um i i had just added like five people to my copy trade program and you know i that's right about when I turn the robot off and go, man, I'm smarter than my robot. So um, I just put in two, two, you know, 
two trades and they were both part of that thousand pip move. But I, you know, luckily I still wasn't a banana head with my position size and I, I didn't have stops on. And I, if you look at that, the UJ pair, um, it came back. It was about six weeks. It took me, you know, stress coming back, but you know, I have a very high win percentage because I don't use stops. Um, but I will tell you, it is it. You have to you have to t- teach yourself how to not panic in those times and not, you know, be. It all starts with that first button push and that position size, and that's a big reason why now I just let the robot do its thing because it's based on ten years of chart data on every pair that i trade which is all of the majors and the crosses so 28 um the robot typically just like rob's finch doesn't do well with jpy pairs so i stay away from those and and those are the ones i look at putting discretionary trades on if i want to add some some trades to my robot once in a while if our drawdown's really low and i want to kind of boost some some gains uh but for the most part you know, I don't get involved until it's an L5, which if I'm an L5, there's a considerable drawdown already on that pair. So then I, uh, you know, bust open, you know, my daily and weekly charts on that pair. I start targeting a good, a good spot uh, with support and resistance and, you know, just be patient. Being patient is, is the one thing I could tell any new trader or, or any trader struggling it's probably due that due to you not being patient. And I know it's extremely hard when you're watching a pair go against you and, you know, the fear just starts taking over and, you know, trading without stops, you got to get used to that. You, you you just, you know, and you got to have, you got to know in in your head, you're going to, you're going to close that trade when it, when it's time. And, you know, that to me, when I'm using a stop loss, it's usually on a discretionary trade that I'm trying to get out like of, of a, an L5 situation with my robot. I mean, when I'm, when I'm trying to trade my way out of some drawdown, I will use stops, but I will not put them where we're all told to put them, right? Because it's the most frustrating thing to me when, you know, you hit a resistance zone and you throw in your trade, you planted a good seed, you might be in some profit already, and you do what we're all told, let your winners run, right? And you and you pull that stop loss right over the 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 la- the former high and then bam, it shoots up, hits you and then and then goes the way you knew it would go. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll give my stops lots of room um when I do put them on. And uh and what's your take profit on that? So it's a trade that just hits, you know, goes straight to take profit. What's that? Uh, on my robot trades? Yeah. It it takes really small profits, uh, five, six pip moves. So, I mean, depending on um, depending on the time frame. So some pairs, some pairs will, I will actually trade the one minute. So on those, it's a, a pretty small position uh it's looking for a divergence you know knoxville divergence on some pairs some pairs i use a flattened out divergence that i i created that flattens out some of the some of the momentum um some of the momentum settings so once that triggers it'll open and i'm looking for let's say on a ten thousand dollar account uh, the typical L1 positions looking for five or six bucks profit, but it will take on a one minute chart. You could see 70 trades a day, just lots of little base hits. Right. And uh, that's what, you know, that's kind of the style I got used to is I don't look for home one home run trades. I just let, I just look for those little moves, almost like a scalping move. And then when the scalp trade doesn't work, I go into my rollovers, which are on higher time frames, and I'm a lot more patient with those. And then if I'm taking discretionary trades, 
you know, I'm looking for 20, 30, 50 pip moves and, you know, just got to be really patient and I'm, I'm sizing those positions more than likely to get myself out of some drawdown. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, you know, the bigger position, the, the, the scary it is. And, you know, that's why I use stops on those just so I don't end up, you know, a statistic. So what do you recommend somebody who's like starting out in trading, they're, they're working a day job. What, what do you recommend they start doing steps? They start taking to, to become well, a, tra- a trader. I, I think it's very important to find someone you relate with and trust. Um, someone that, you know, you can speak your language per se, right? There's lots of people out there selling courses and, and, uh, offering up, you know, advice. And, you know, I caution people cause there's a lot of them out there who are just looking to make money off, off of you on their course that aren't really traders. Um, so, but I think you're going to, I think you will get a lot further faster by watching someone else trade than just going at yourself. And, you know, I kind of took the hard route. Yes, I did follow some of Rob Booker's uh, teachings, but I wasn't like all in, right. I, I still was skeptical and was like, well, I'm, I'm a smart guy. You know, I went from a plumber to director of engineering, a self-taught mechanical engineer. I could figure this out. And I think that's kind of the trap a lot of people get into when they first start trading is they think they're going to be the golden child. They're never going to take a big loss. And, you know, I can remember when I first turned my variation of the Fench on, I was making 10% a week. And I was in a, a trading chat room showing my, uh, you know, account and tell, you know, people are like, dude, those are way too big sizes of trades. You're going to blow your account up. And I think I remember I, I, I made $90,000 in five months and then I gave it all back. I, I gave all the profit back because I was just naive of drawdown. You know, you're only looking at your balance grow and you, I wasn't looking at the drawdown as tight as I should have been. And then that's kind of what set me on to the settings I use today with, look, I'm okay with 1% a week. I mean, it, 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 it's very consistent. I could almost, I could almost guarantee you'll make 1% balance gains each week, but your equity swings are going to swing anywhere from, you know, 3%. And in really bad times, as high as 20% drawdown. So you have to learn how to manage yourself in those cases and, and work your way out of those positions. And, you know, sometimes the right answer is just to pause it and wait and let price come back. And then you just, you know, you're, you're in a danger spot when you're at 20% drawdown and you're just deciding to, to, to wait it out and you have a black swan event. But I think you've, you know, you got a, quite a bit of room there to just wait it out. And if you don't panic in those situations, a lot of times price will come back. Um, and, you know, it just takes experience. So I've been in L5s where I don't even try to trade my way out because where the robot got in is just so far away. It, it, it just got in, like, let's say, let's say we're in a support zone on a daily chart. And it put in a bunch of sell trades right at the bottom. And then now, now the wave is taking it way up and, you know, I might just close those. I might sacrifice my profit for that week and say, you know what, I'm going to go flat this week, but I'm going to take this loss, you know? Mm-hmm. And oftentimes <clears throat> robot, when it's in an L5, when it's in an L5 situation, it's usually draw you know it's usually accumulate a loss of maybe one or two weeks worth of profit which if you just decide to move on move on take you know take the little bit of loss and now you open the robot to trade that pair again yeah Yeah. you know let it go back to work so so what does your typical trading day look like well um i'm a very early riser so I get up around 4 a.m. Um, 
I might look at the the charts then, uh, or I put on Squawk Box or uh, Bloomberg TV and just try to get caught up with how how the European market did overnight before the U.S. market opens. Um, I'll scan through the charts maybe an hour hour or two. Uh, I post I post a lot of trading ideas on TradingView.com. You know, and these would be discretionary trades, right? Uh, I don't post my robot trades on there because it, you know, it's a little too hard. But I, I tend to plot date on the daily charts. I plot supply and demand zones or support and resistance, and then I kind of, you know, I, I, I open the robot up and I kind of manipulate which direction the robot can trade. If I'm not already in trades on a pair. And on the daily chart, I'm I'm reaching a resistance area. I will tell it to only take sell trades only, which is another item I added that's on top of the finch, right? I, I can tell it what direction I I want it to, to look at as opposed to just looking either way. So I find when I when I've added that little bit of a human filter to it, um, you know, the drawdown I you know is is like where I'm at today, my only goal is to keep limiting drawdown on this system I have. It, it makes money. The Like I said, the only downfall I have is, you know, the scary times with, with drawdown. So I'm always looking at how do I better that and how do I, how do I, me as the CEO of this program, how do I, how do I keep filtering that and keeping that lower? Because, you know, the more and more clients I add, who've never traded. And I would say 90% of my clients are people that have never heard of Forex. They had a little bit of risk capital and, you know, they love my trading results and they love having access, you know, access to me, but they've never experienced drawdown. Right. And they're, they're, you know, watching these trades roll in on their phone and they're like, Oh my God, there's a big red negative number. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's drawdown. It's okay. As long as that number is not over 20% of your balance, you know, I'm still playing ball. I'm still looking for base hits. Now, if we get near that 20%, we're, um, you know, we're going to pause it and, you know, I'm going to trade my way out of it, which, you know, I've done over and over and over again in my, in my, my own accounts. So now after we, I look at the charts uh, I'll look at my positions and then, you know, I'll throw in a workout after the U.S. after the U.S. equities markets open um, and we start hitting that slow period. I'll, I'll uh, work out. I'll get on some social media stuff, do some posts and then, uh, you know, spend the rest of the day with my kids. And then uh, I'll see how the Asia, the Sydney and Asian markets are doing at night. And I might put a few trades on at night. You know, after I put my kids to bed, I like to uh, get back on the charts and look for some good overnight trades uh, that, you know, I, I will set a stop loss on those because I'm not watching them. I'll set a, you know, pretty big stop loss and then a take profit. Um, but that's pretty rare. You know, once in a while, I'll throw those on just if I'm feeling, feeling, you know, have a really good trade setup going on. I'll do it. But for the most part, I just let the robot do what it's programmed to do. And so you, are you with the discretionary stuff, are you mainly using supply and demand zone type style trading? Yeah. Um, I love using the pivot indicator. Um, so I use on trading view, I use the standard pivots indicator. And I only look at the S2 and R2 levels and I use the Fibonacci setting for the calculation of the S2 and R2. Um, I'll look at a daily and undiscretionarily if, if prices, let's say prices hit an R2 on the daily chart. Um, that might be where I, that's typically where I would enter uh, R2 or S2. I will enter a trade opposite of where price is going and you know i know there's a lot of trend traders out there and we're all 
taught the trade with the trend, but I'm, I'm more the style where I look for when an impulse or a move in that direction is going to either be a reversal or a pullback. So when I see price hit S2 or R2, I start looking for a trade in the opposite direction, right? So I'll, I'll put, you know, if I'll put a sell trade if it's hitting R2 and I'll typically look for the pivot as my take profit. So I'll trade back towards that pivot um, and the closer and closer it gets to the pivot, you know, I'll, I'll set a, a, a stop loss, you know, where I'm already in profit and, you know, it may not get all the way to the pivot where I have my take profit. So if it bounces back up, then I'm out with, with profit. And, you know, I'm not a big stickler on let your profits run for, you know, I find when I set take profits, I oftentimes close them before they get there only because, uh, you know, I already have a bunch of profit on the table and I don't like leaving it on the table very long. So I will, I will take my profits and run and, and not feel bad about it. I, you know, and I feel like when you're setting, you're trying to be too perfect. And I find out, I find when I allowed myself to quit being so perfect and quit demonizing myself, you know, looking at that, that, that pair uh, days later and going, Oh man, it, it went to the take profit. I should have left it, you know, and you beat yourself up. You know, once I quit doing all that and I quit trying to be, you know, the perfect trader that everyone, you know, aspires to be, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I would love for hundred percent of my trades to be huge winners, but I just know that's not, it's not, you know, very easy to do and it's not conducive. And, and if, you're on that quest to be that perfect trader. You probably are going to take a lot of losses and, and not get there because I mean, you, you've probably heard it a million times on your show. Trading is 99, eh, 90% emotional, you know, control. Anyone, anyone can learn basic strategies that do work. But the reason why they don't work for some people is they, they freak out when it moves 20 pips against them and they're like, Oh, I'm wrong. I'm out. And then, you know, you gotta be patient. You gotta give your trades lots of room and you gotta just trust in your system and be confident. I mean, I, where I'm at today, when I put a trade on, I, I almost just have it programmed that I know that trade's going to win. You know, I don't, I don't even put in my head, I mean, obviously, I know it could not win, and I know where my mental stop is, but I, you know, I give myself room, and if that trade didn't work out exactly the way I planned it when I entered it, I go to work. I use strategies I've learned, you know, the rollover trades. It, it becomes a little project for me now. Now I focus on that pair. I may not take any other trades, and then I save my margin to be able to strike another rollover trade to, to win my way out of that that movement against me cool well look let's dive into the quick fire round and uh, find right. out what it takes to become successful in this gig so how long did it take you to go from newbie to consistently profitable Ooh, three years thinking about a trader's mindset do you have any special techniques you can share with us ah uh, no i getting away I, i'd say the best thing that works for me, uh, you know, when I'm feeling negative about trading, which it happens to all of us, is I just get away from it for a little while, right? I don't, I've learned not to get that FOMO where, oh my God, I took a little bit of a loss. I got to hurry up and make it back. Um, you know, I just wash all that out. I might, I, I've been known to take a week or two off of trading. I just pause my robot. I might, if I have any open positions, I, you know, I'll scan them once a day, but, uh, you know, just get away from it for a while, come back and, you know, that will really help you get back into focus and, and, you know, ditch all the negativity that you put on yourself. What's your favorite entry setup? Uh, favorite entry setup would probably be divergence, uh, to be more specific, Knoxville divergence. Um, against the trend 
right? Uh, against the way price is moving. So if I see Knoxville divergence post on a daily chart and it's hitting R2, I'm, I'm selling. I'm not even waiting. I'm just going to put in a sell trade. And if it happens to be wrong, I'll just uh, work my way out uh, on another pullback after it's moved against me. What's your recommended trading book or resource? Uh, I love two of them. I love uh, trading in the zone and I love, um, why, why is it not coming to me? Trading in the zone and think and grow rich, which isn't necessarily a trading specific book, but it is a great book for someone who's looking to get into the trader mindset and just, just win. So those are, those are my two favorite books. Cool. If there was one thing you'd recommend any retail trader spend the next month mastering, what would it be? Why? And how could they go about mastering it? Uh, I think every trader needs to understand support and resistance and drawing trend lines. I mean, it almost is, is like, you need to learn how to walk before you can run and understanding why support and resistance works, how to trade from those levels and then how to draw trend lines and what a trend line break. I mean, some of the, the basics and they could go about finding that anywhere. I mean, you, if you just go to YouTube and put support and resistance and Forex trading, there's probably a, a million videos on it. Find someone there you trust, watch a couple of those other videos I mean, you're going to find someone there that you that you can listen to and watch a half hour video on it and it's not boring. Um, and, you know, you're probably going to find some people that have videos that are super boring <laughs> and you can't sit through 10 minutes of it. So find find someone that you, you can listen to, learn support and resistance, learn what a channel is, learn what a trend line break is and, you know, plot them yourself on the charts until you feel comfortable with it. What's your preferred broker and trading platform? Uh, preferred broker is Oanda. Um, I've never used anyone else. I've never had a problem with them. Um, I get cash back rebates uh, on all the spreads I pay by going through a uh, introducing broker. Um, so, you know, it's my only experience. That's my disclaimer. I, I haven't used anyone else. I've, I've never had to. Trading platform. Uh, I use MT4, obviously. That's where my EA's uh, coded onto and, and installed on. But I don't take discretionary. Uh, I don't use their charts. I use TradingView charts to do all my discretionary trading uh, analysis but I'll execute the trade right on my MT4 app on my phone. If you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, patience. Don't be in a rush. You know, like, like your, your thing in the beginning of the show, don't be in a rush to be a millionaire. Too many traders uh, want to go from a thousand dollar account to a millionaire in a year. And it's just, it's just not feasible. And if, if that's your goal, if that's what you're shooting for, you're probably not going to get there. So set small attainable goals, be consistent, uh, work, on, work on your, your faults, right? And you should be using a trade journal to identify those. But just be patient. Be patient. Tell yourself in five years, you, you know, you're consistently winning in the, in the markets and you might get there. Cool. All right. Well, before you wrap up, what's the best way for traders to get hold of you? Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is um, go to my website, which is www.allenfx.com. Fill in the questionnaire there, or they could shoot me an email at Clayton A, that's C L A Y T O N A, at allenfx.com. Brilliant. Well, look, a big thank you to Clayton today for sharing with us. Everything we've discussed here, along with all the links, are going to be in the show notes. To find them, simply search for Clayton in the search box on tradingnut.com. Until next time, I wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. All right, folks, so there we have it. Interview with Clayton done. Hopefully you got a lot out of that. I'm, I especially did, given the fact that we, uh, well, when I say we, Guys who are part of my Robot Traders Club are trading. Some of them are trading the the Feed the Beast bot, which uh, which 
does trade very similar to what uh, the Finch trades, um, albeit it's very different as well. So similar in terms of it hasn't got a stop loss. So being able to hear from someone who's done some massive numbers and been so transparent with without the stop loss is is really. I suppose promising from a from a point of view of knowing that that's what's possible, and also um, it gives some he gave some ideas there around how you can manage that as well. Uh, now, what we did do after the show was we jumped onto screen sharing, and so he walked through a price chart and gave us the great foundation of a wee strategy that he uses for his manual discretionary trading. So, guys, go and check that out right now. Uh, there should be a link in the description or the show notes if you're on the, uh, the website. If not, head over to tradingnut.com and you'll find it there. Okay, guys, um, stay safe and I'll see you either in the markets or back here next time this comes out.